Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Aho here with KissAnalog.com. Um, this video series, and it will be a series, it's going to be a power supply design aimed at providing a power supply for audio amplifier, uh, audio power amplifier, 50 watt amplifier to be exact. This um, was inspired by John Audio Tech. He's doing I think he just finished his third in a series of an audio power amplifier design. Um, anybody watching his series knows how good he is and how good he is at explaining things. Um, I hope to do that on this power supply design. I'm a power supply engineer by trade and um, I was going to do a series on uh, switch mode power supplies, which I will do as well later on. But first I want to do this. this uh, I got excited watching his videos and you know if you're gonna have a good um, audio amplifier you have to have a good power supply uh, years ago when I got into designing audio stuff um, power supplies for audio I, I realized how some of the power supplies for the amplifiers weren't quite up to snuff so uh, but but I also realized that some of the companies who would try to separate themselves from their competition would explain how good their power supplies were. So it made me feel good as a power supply engineer that how important they were. And uh, so what we wanna do is we wanna design the power supply. And even though it's only a 50 watt amplifier, it sounds like only 50 watts, but really 50 watts is quite a bit of power. Uh, it depends on how good that 50 watt amplifier is. Cause 50 watts is audio talk. That's into eight ohms. Um, in the two ohms or four, four ohms, um, you know, what is it? Um, some power supplies or audio amplifiers may not give a whole lot more power across those different uh, impedances. But speakers, real speakers, um, they're not, it may be called an eight ohm speaker, but it's not eight ohms across a frequency band. Uh, music plays, um, you know, from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Um, and those frequencies um, will drive the speaker differently because of the impedance of the speaker. So a good audio amplifier can drive that and it has to have good power supply behind it. So that's what we wanna do. That's what this video is about. So I'm going to come at this at a high level to make it accessible for anybody at any level of understanding electronics. To, to understand hopefully. And um, I'm gonna show enough depth that, and I'm gonna try to hopefully provide it in a way that it's understandable. And I'm also gonna have some support videos um, where I can go a little deeper dive. Um, and again, I'll start at a high level for someone who's just learning, and then we'll go down a little deeper so that you get a really good understanding of how it works. And most of the math these days, you know, that we can use, we don't need to try to use any crazy math. It's just pretty much simple algebra. And I'll show that on these pages. I've got um, the design concept on a page here and I've got a block diagram. And I also have I want to talk about the, the wattage again, the 50 watts. Um, if you're into 50 watts and 8 ohms, when that speaker looks like 4 ohms, that, that wave shape, if you don't want to distort it, you have to provide the power into 4 ohms, which would be double what it is at 8 ohms, so it would be 100 watts. And then, you know, if it drops down to 2 ohms, which it very well could, then it has to double again, so 200 watts. So kind of jumping to the quick, um, kind of giving it away a little bit. Um, we're gonna design this power supply for a good 200 watts. And now if you had a marketing guy who was a little slicker, uh, instead of calling it a 50 watt amplifier, because maybe, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, um, then, you know, you could pull out your marketing calculator and say, well, uh, peak to peak power hey we've got 800 watts or even higher uh, depending on how you do that I'm going to show you how using that math you can come up with that um, now those figures actually 
do kind of tell how good a power supply is dynamically um, or power amplifier. Um, so, so those numbers do have some value in understanding where the peak powers have to be uh, and what you want to provide. But when you try to sell somebody on saying you have an 800 watt amplifier peak to peak, then you know that's being a little bit tricky because you know the average person may not understand the difference between uh, peak to peak power and and average power or whatever. So uh, anyway, that that math and and as far as component selection, the next video we'll go into start uh, we'll go a little deeper dive into the design. We'll start looking at different components and we'll do some trade studies that. You know, why would we choose this part over this part? You know, there's a cost, performance, benefit trade-off. And so we'll have some of those things. So those of you that want to go more performance, you can choose those parts. And those who want to save little, we can go that way. But either way you go, we're going to have a very robust power supply. No question about it. It's going to do a great job. And hopefully when anybody does any testing, we're going to do our own testing. Um, we have uh, some active loads here. I've got some DC loads, some non-reactive loads. And I guess when I talk about dynamic impedance of a speaker, um, it's reactive. You know, it can be capacitive or inductive work. Most likely, you know, it's really going to be a combination of the three. It's going to have resistance, capacitance, and inductance. And depending on the frequency and the type of speaker it is, those combinations will weigh differently. But um, I think if we build a nice stiff power supply for an audio amplifier that can drive anything from 2 ohms up to 8 ohms or above, then I think we should be good. And that 50 watt amplifier is going to sound like a lot bigger amplifier than than what 50 watts makes it sound like. Anyway, getting excited about it. Hope you guys are too. Uh, and we'll see you next video. Uh, but before we go there, let's get down in and I'll show you the block diagram and I'll show you the, the, the page with some math. And I'll also show you the marketing math if you wanna say, hey, we got 800 watt peak to peak amplifier. So let's get into those things too, okay? I'll bring the camera a little closer so we can see that. Okay, so this is our first sheet in this new design. It's the project is the power supply design, 50 amps, and the title for this sheet is design goals. And a lot of this is given to us by uh, John. And I'm just going to go, so some of this is a repeat of what he's already done, but basically from a 50 watt amplifier into 8 ohms, um, how many volts do we need to get that? And how much current do we need? What we use is this equation here, um, power is equal to voltage squared divided by resistance, V squared over R. So we know what R is, 8 ohms and V is what we're going to look for and power is 50 watts so deriving that equation down to what we know is 50 watts times 8 ohms and take the square root of that gives you 20 volts and that's in RMS as units so we're going to add the 4 volts that John recommended for overhead that's for the circuitry to operate, still provide 20 volts RMS, but we need to know what the peak value, what the rails, what the actual DC rails are going to be. And so we have to find what the peak voltage is from 20 volts, which it's, the peak is equal to square root of two times the RMS voltage, which is right here, 28.28 volts peak. So that's what we need. We need a plus voltage rail of 28.28 uh, and we need a negative voltage rail at 28.28. But now we're gonna add the four volts we talked about. So 
really what we want is 32.28 plus or minus voltage rails. So how much current do we need? Well, 50 watts is given, you know, at eight ohms. At four ohms, it would be 100 watts. If we had a signal, a sine wave, that was plus or minus 20 volts RMS, it would be 50 watts into eight ohms. That same signal into four ohms would be 100 watts, and that same signal into two ohms would be 200 watts. In the 16 ohms, it'd be only 25 watts. So the speakers are never really, you know, it may say 8 ohms on the speaker, but that's nominal. Um, their dynamic range is going to change over frequency. And so we're going to say, we're going to, we're going to expect to see something between 2 ohms and maybe even as high as 16 ohms. Um, and so the RMS value of the current with that power in the eight, 8 ohms it would be 2.5 amps RMS and then again 5 amps doubling and for 4 ohms and 2 ohms would be doubling again 10 amps RMS so now we're all the way up to 10 amps RMS so when we look at the peak value, again, that's just the RMS value times square root of two. We do the peak values, we come up with these numbers. Uh, the eight ohm, it's 3.54 amps peak, but at two ohms, it's 14.14 .14 amps peak. So now we know that we need a plus or minus 32.28 voltage rail, and we need each rail to provide 10 amps RMS. And again, this is um, output power. This is into our amplifier. Um, the circuitry itself, the audio amplifier circuitry itself and the power supply circuitry is gonna have some headroom as far as current goes. I mean, we talked about giving four volts headroom for the power amplifier, but we also have to give some headroom for current. There's gonna, you know, it's not 100% efficient, right? So. We'll find out what the efficiency is and we'll have to make sure we have enough current to run our circuitry and still have enough current to provide this at the output power. So that is our goal. And so now what I'm gonna do is scan down here, just show you an example wave shape here. So just, just a talking um, graph here that I can talk to. Um, it shows that we're gonna swing a peak uh, 28.28 and down to minus 28.28 so we're gonna have a wave shape could be at any frequency and at any frequency we don't want um, that wave shape not having enough voltage so that it sags or gets distorted uh, so when we look at these impedances here and the, the currents that might be required for those different uh, speaker impedances, you know, we want to be able to provide that. We want this power supply to be um, So we want this power supply to be transparent to the audio amp. We want the audio amp to be able to work without being You know impeded by the power supply. So the goal is clean dynamic power with the 32.28 plus or minus voltage rails and 10 amp RMS capability. So that's what our goal is. Now let me just show you a scope picture. So this is another talking point here, just to give some visual cues. Um, so this, oops, sorry, I'm just messing with this tripod. Um, okay, so this wave shape here is just sweeping between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. It's just an example of the frequencies that might take place. And if these were the top of our peak waveforms, um, I would say 20 volts, are, well, of 28.28 volt peaks, let's say that that was the, you know, the peaks of our waveform. At any one of those frequencies, no matter what the penis of the speaker is, we would want those things to be able to 
we would want the amplifier to be able to amplify that signal cleanly and therefore um, our power supply really needs to be able to provide that 200 watts at 2 ohms um, to make sure that that can happen. So that's the goal. Let's go back down and look at the block diagram of our circuit. Whoops. Okay, so now we have our block diagram. And this is our basic concept. And these blocks may change. Viewers might have some recommendations. I might come up with some changes myself. Uh, but it basically, I, I think these blocks you know, look pretty good at this point. The power will come into some kind of circuit protection, maybe something as simple as a fuse, which by the way, isn't simple, but we'll go over what that circuit protection is. Um, if we have a fault in our circuit, we want to be able to protect the line power and our circuit from getting any further damage. And the line filter, we want to protect our circuit from any noise that might be generated on the line. And we want to make sure that we don't, um, if we do have any noise here, we want to make sure it doesn't get out on the line and interrupt any of our other, you know, components we have plugged in. So then after the line filler, we're going to come through a step-down transformer. Um, the step-down transformer does two things. As I say, it's a step-down, so that gives a hint to one of them. Um, it's going to drop our 115 volts RMS. We're talking US here, 60 hertz, 115. We may talk about 220 or 50 hertz as well, but I think we will at least talk about it, but we're going to design this for 115. Um, volts RMS and 60 Hertz um, through the transformer we're going to drop it down to something that will give us our 35 volt um, or s somewhere around 35 volts probably um, so um, oh okay the second thing is it provides isolation it isolates this primary circuitry, the circuitry that's on the primary power from the secondary um, circuitry, secondary power. Um, so we have galvanic isolation between the two stages. Um, so that means basically our, essentially what that means is our ground and our power over here is not DC connected to this side. There's no DC path and so then after the transformer it's going to go into an ac dc stage which can be as something as simple as a bridge rectifier and bulk storage capacitors um that you know some folks might just think that the more bulk capacitors is better but then if we're going to do this regulation stage then that may not be true that that can have adverse effects on the on the rectifier stage um that well i guess this is in the same stage here rectifier stage and ac bulk capacitors um but anyway we're going to we'll talk about those trade-offs and then we're going to go through another power filter just something you know we i don't expect to have to clean up a lot of signal but we'll just have some kind of filtering here and then our regulation stage um this could be maybe something very simple and it'll most likely have some kind of circuit protection in it as well for the secondary side. We have it on the primary side. It would be nice to have some on the secondary side. So, um, so this could be simple to complex, but by the time we talk about it, I think it's all going to be looking fairly simple. It just may be the circuit might be more complex, more, more components. Um, maybe slightly higher cost. So we'll talk about the trade-offs and all these steps and how each step or each block, um, you know, how what the ramifications are to the other blocks. Um, so I think that's a good start on our block diagram. All right, so now we're talking about marking calculations. Um, I call it marking calculations because people like to use 
um, certain kind of numbers for selling a product and the marketing guys are great at that um, sometimes they take them out of context but if it sounds great then they kind of like to do it um, so what we want if we want to show a big number is what is the wattage peak to peak and to do that we can say okay well we know we need 20 volts RMS and the peak power peak voltage is 28.28 volts um, the peak to peak voltage is twice that it's 56.57 volts peak to peak so then we use our power formula put that voltage and square it so you know that's gonna be a big number and then we never choose a resistance to divide that by and if we choose say four ohms then we end up with 800 watts peak to peak so see our little 50 watt amp fire is really at 800 watt peak to peak let's see that sounds great right um now hey what if we would have chose two ohms um sh you know that doubles that number right so i mean that sounds like big numbers sounds impressive uh but you know what a 50 watt amp fire what i call a true 50 watt amp fire that really can provide that amplification across the dynamic impedance of your speaker if it can go 50 watts 8 ohms and 200 watts 2 ohms um, then that is an impressive amplifier so anyway i guess i've kind of gone over the marketing calculations all right so i hope we're all getting excited about doing these designs it's gonna be fun we're gonna go over the de design we're gonna test things we're going to show signals i'm going to demonstrate things i'm going to make it so that you feel like you can design your own power supply after this um, and you will be able to um, whether you're an experienced user or not i think you're going to be able to do this um, so okay so that brings up how I want to approach these videos. I'm going to I'm going to go to a high level and show just enough math and talk about in detail the components we're going to choose and why we're going to do it. And so you understand at that level. And if what you want to do is just uh, get these parts, solder them together, build it up, and power up your amplifier, you'll be good to go. Uh, if you want to understand the circuitry and your interest in that kind of stuff. I'm going to have videos on that as well. So I'll have some support videos for these topics so that you can kind of delve into that. But I'll try to keep, and, and, and by the way, those videos are not going to be overly complex. They're going to also start at a high level and, and, and I'll make it as simple as I can. Um, I think I can do that. As a matter of fact, I used to teach electronics, so I've had a, a little experience in that and so i i think we can do a good job here and i think it's gonna be fun and we're gonna also use uh utilize um, a lot of equipment we have active loads scopes and what we're going to do is show the features of these scopes and how to use those and how they apply to um, these circuits and how there's features in these new scopes that you know people in the past may have never used because they didn't have access to like say a spectrum analyzer or something where now we have fft and these scopes so there's some cool features about that i have a thd analyzer coming so we're going to use that as well and we're going to kind of show how using different instruments you can get these uh, readings so if you don't have a particular instrument you can do it another way and i'm going to try to show that and so some of these will be support videos so that the design of this doesn't get too weighed down. But, but I, I will put enough in this that, you know, it'll be fun and there'll be some good information. And I hope you want to watch some of the other support videos as well. Um, so, and by the way, as far as building this, um, if there's enough interest, I'll get a circuit board and, um, you know, I'll get a, I think I'll get a kit together with the parts. Um, at least I'll show the part by, 
well, okay, I guess that leads to something else. Uh, as far as the parts, when we select these parts, like in the next video, I'll show you where you can get them yourself. Um, you don't have to wait for me to put together a kit unless you want to. If there is interest in that, I'll put together a kit. But if you want to go out and buy your own parts and so on, I'm going to show you where you get those parts and how much they cost. And that's part of the trade-off on selecting parts for this thing. What we want is a robust power supply. And we don't have to spend a lot of money doing it. But and there might be a case where you spend $5 more for, say, a transformer. $10 more. Something like that. Uh, that might be one of the more expensive components in this design. Um, so something like that's worth doing, right? Um, so anyway, we're not going to, you know... Uh, we're not going to be trying to save every penny, but at the same time, um, we're going to show the trade-off. You know, if you want to buy this transformer versus that transformer, um, you have those options. I'll show you where to get them. And if you want me to put together a kit, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Um, so, okay, well, um, I guess that's enough for this video. Part two will come up shortly. I'm going to try to put these videos together every couple few days and uh, try to get the Sapphire design done. So, hope you enjoyed it and hope you're excited about this like I am. So, thanks for watching.